Good morning. Good morning. You would like to turn with me to the book of Joel. That's in the middle sized book. Joel, the second chapter. I'm going to read uh, some selected parts of this chapter for your hearing, and I'll try to lead you through that. Starting with uh, chapter 2 of the book of Joel, verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and a day of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Verse 11. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. For his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments. And repent, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he will turn away the evil from you. Therefore repent, and who knoweth, but he will return and leave a blessing behind him, that you may offer a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn Assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast, and let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests the ministers of the Lord. Weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine her- thy heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his people and pity his for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto this people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and you shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. Verse 27. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. And that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. I'd like to speak just for a few moments this morning on keeping our vow that we have made with the Lord 
Jesus Christ. Let me tell you a story. I love stories, well known, storyteller. Most of the time, they're, they're dead on. So I embellish a little bit. It makes for a good story. Uh, the last time I was up here and shared a sermon with you, I talked about um, vows and what I promised I had made. Uh, I was going to stop drinking Diet Coke, and uh, which it was a beloved beverage of mine. Not that I'm here to argue whether Diet Coke or Coke or caffeine is good or bad. That's for another day and someone else. But I promised a friend that I was going to do that, and I broke that promise without unwittingly thinking about it and had to repent of that. And then I started drinking, of course, tons of regular Coke. And uh, that wasn't going to work. Um, uh, my brothers and I are lucky. We have inherited our mother's tendency for high blood pressure. Thanks, Mom. Dad died at 92, never had any high blood pressure till the end. And uh, I quickly figured out this wasn't going to work. And uh, um, I get a little jolt out of Coke. And I was on a trip out west with a couple older students, another faculty member, a photography trip. And I was at a meal, not thinking of this at all, and I got ready to order a beverage. And they knew I was going to order Coke. And I looked at the menu, and I said, I would like a glass of water, please, which surprised them. And I announced at the table, I'm done with that. In that moment, for some reason, I can't explain to you why. I, I, I drank Coke all my life, and I have some brothers that I share this great love for. I decided that that claim on my soul had been with me long enough. And in that moment, I, I really believe in that moment, there was power in my life to never drink a caffeinated dark soda again. And it's been four months and I don't really even have a desire. Is that unbelievable, Jeff? That's unbelievable. And that got me thinking about vows and promises. Uh, and so I want to share just a, a few minutes about that. Historically, a vow, uh, we, we, we find record of that. Uh, some early uh, stories about uh, uh, those that were uh, Nazarites, uh, would take a vow, and that vow would separate themselves from someone else, and part of that vow was not shaving their head. Uh, there's other places uh, Paul references in the New Testament where he made a vow, we don't know what that vow is, and he shaved his head. But we find that a vow historically was considered a binding contract between two people, whether that was between men or between men and the Lord. Modern Revelation uh, tells us something of that. If you'd like to turn with me to uh, the Doctrine and Covenants, section 59. In 59, we have a reference to this, and I think it's appropriate for the rest of our remarks today. So, section 59, 2a. Wherefore, I give unto them a commandment, saying thus, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy might, mind, and strength, and in the name of Jesus Christ thou shalt serve him. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Thou shalt not steal, neither commit adultery, neither kill, nor do anything like unto it. Thou shalt thank the Lord thy God in all things. Thou shalt offer a sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in righteousness, even that of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And that thou mayest more fully keep thyself unspotted from the world, thou shalt go to the house of prayer and offer up thy sacraments upon my holy day, for verily this is the day appointed unto thee to rest from thy labors and to pay thy devotions unto the Most High. Nevertheless, thy vows, thy promises to the Lord, shall be offered up in righteousness on all days and at all times. And so the crux of my message today is this vow that we made to Jesus, who is our Lord. And the question I pose to you is, why do you think that Jesus is Lord? That sounds kind of silly. We're all Christians. Most of us have made some type of commitment uh, and been baptized in the, the, the waters and, and, and promised to serve him. Why is Jesus our Lord? Now, I teach college. That's what I do. And I believe in the modified uh, Socratic method, I ask a question or start a sentence, and then the audience 
finishes it. So why is Jesus Lord? Okay, this is this part where someone answers back from the congregation, why is Jesus Lord? It was chosen, that's good. He created all things. So therefore, with the power of the Father, so therefore we are incumbent on him for everything we know and see in our lives because he made us. And because of that, he did what? The second thing. Which he was chosen for. He came down and lived a life and died the perfect sacrifice so that by his grace we might be forgiven. Would you go along with those two things? We could spend all day, but for the sake of brevity, those two things. He created us, made what we are, to not just what we are today, but he makes what we will be every day. Because everything we know, everything we see is wrapped up in Jesus Christ. He died a sacrifice to save us, thereby his grace is sufficient. Since he was called and chosen and he was perfect, He was the only one that could offer the sacrifice, therefore allowing him to take our place. Therefore, he can forgive our sin. He is then Lord of our life, and that's that's where the rub is. He is Lord of my life. The problem is that statement means a different thing to everyone internally. Arthur Oatman, I used this, this reading the last time I spoke here, and it's, it fits, and so I'm going to read it again. It's from um, his book, Who Is He? And Arthur Oatman makes this statement, which fits very well. To pursue the cause of the kingdom requires the life of the whole man, body, mind, spirit. It does not take much of a man to be a Latter-day Saint. We'll say man slash woman. But it takes all of him or her that there is. There is no inviting the Lord Jesus Christ to dine with you in your house if there are some portions of your personality that are locked to his entrance. He demands all or nothing. And I believe that axiom is true, and in the next few minutes I'm going to tell you why. If we have truly truly chosen him as a Christian, taking upon us his name, that's what that means, and made a vow in the waters of baptism to follow him, no matter the cost to us, we are required and should cheerfully take upon us his name and therefore walk and talk and act like Christians. Let's go to John 8, 28. John 8, 28. Jesus did nothing, it says in several places, but those things that pleased the Father. John 8, 28. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. A man of no reputation. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things, and he that has sent me is with me, the Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. And to follow that line of reasoning then, if you take upon yourself the name of Christ to do the things that he would do to the end of your days, you would do only those things that please the Father. Therefore, bearing the name, and bearing the activities, and the life of Christ, witnessing to others of a life in Christ. Unfortunately, For most all of us, at one time or another, we do not. And that's problematic. And here's why. His grace, we talked about earlier, can forgive our daily sins. But he can't keep us from the act and lifestyle of sinning. Because that's a choice that we make. And I hope you see that difference. 
Christ cannot and will not make that choice for you. He cannot because the Father granted you and I agency, the right to choose, to choose good or to choose evil. And even though Jesus can forgive you those things that you ask him to freely, and he does any time that you're seriously engaged or not, not on sacrament study necessarily, not at church, but whenever you humbly and truly and sincerely ask with a desire to change your life, he can forgive those sins. What he cannot do and will not do is change your decision to walk after him. That is a choice we must make on our own. That's why we have and the purpose for agency. Oakman says this, and I like it. You don't Go to church to build character. You go to church to see the kind of man you ought to be, or woman. And then feeling the swell, the power, and insight of the spirit, you are invited to go out and toil in the affairs of men, of business, work, and I'll add school, whatever it is. And as you toil, you feel that presence that you did when you were in that worship. And your character is made out there six days a week. As you earn your bread... Whatever you do does something to you. And the only thing you ever had, the only thing we'll ever have, is what we will then do. Because a man, what a man does is what he becomes. So I want to talk just a little bit about allowing the Lord access to our hidden places. All of us saints have some really ugly sins. We don't like to acknowledge that, and we certainly don't confess it very often. And we have some personality traits that are ungodly. Foremost of all is pride. And it manifests itself in some things that I know I have seen in my life, and I have seen in the lives of the saints, whether that's gossip, whether it's negative, demeaning attitude to others, complainers. My wife could bear testimony. I bear witness to you, I am a complainer. You may not hear it at church, but when I get tired and I get stressful and my life is too full, which it often is because I will not say no, I become a complainer. And that's, that's it's unholy and it's ugly in the sight of the Lord. Selfishness, addictions, deceitfulness, worldly and desires and behavior, slothfulness, unforgiving nature. I could spend all day. The scripture is full of them. And not only are we guilty of the offense, but we seek to justify it to ourselves and we seek to justify it to everyone we worship with. Paul made that, and both Paul and Peter in the New Testament call attention to that, that often those those. Sinners, and, they, and we read them, we think, oh, those vile sinners, and that list includes us. That not only did they sin knowingly, but took joy in the sinning and convinced each other that it was okay. And you can ask God sincerely to forgive you of some sin, and he freely does. But often, that grace that's applied to those sins becomes what we've talked about in the sanctuary before that Diedrich Bonhoeffer calls cheap grace that we believe in the back of our minds, though we, though we theoretically you know, tell ourselves, I don't believe in this, that he's a never-ending dispenser of grace. And that no matter how many times I sin, and no matter how many times I do things that are an offense to him, I can go to him and forgive him. And in part, that is true. But as I mentioned earlier, the consequence of that is, if we ask him to forgive some sins, But do not allow him in those personality characteristics or those hidden places of our heart where those sins remain. And we do not confess those before him. And we're not accountable to our brothers and sisters. And don't ask for that forgiveness. Then that grace, that forgiveness that's applied to those few sins, do not bear fruit. Forgiveness of sin brings us back into, for a moment in the presence of God because he freely forgives us. But if the character of our life in the secret places continues to be sinful, therefore separating ourselves from the ministry and love and mercy of Christ, the grace has no redemption because we never become like him. In that condition, never changing, so the repeated forgiveness and grace has no fruit. 
And if we die in that condition, the effect is in our redemption that we don't truly accept Christ as our Lord. We accept him as a friend. We accept him as a good mentor. We accept, accept, accept him as a person with some really good ideas, but not someone who has dominion and reign over the good things that we should do. And he can't force us to do that because of our agency. So I think this morning there needs to be some acknowledging of our vow, that he is Lord of my life. And that means he has dominion over every thought we have. He has dominion over every action that we partake in, every moment of every day. And we don't like that. The natural man does not like that. There is no place in our life where his dominion should not rule. The problem that I have in my life, and as Brian said so eloquently during the series that I perceive that we have here at Colburn, is that some of those ungodly, unrighteous, unholy activities and personality traits we have, we think are just fine, even though the scriptures make it very clear that they're an abomination to him. And we continue to live that life like it's okay and continue to go to sacrament service and ask forgiveness for those things which we think are bad and leave the rest in the pot to make it all filthy and dirty. We have to accept in our minds that we are natural beasts at times. We're carnal and sensual and devilish by nature. I made that statement one time with some Christian friends uh, at the college that was riding to lunch one day, and they all said, I can't buy that. And I said, I'm really sorry. It's in the Word. It's just there. How many of you ever watched the, uh, one of my favorite movies, uh, Dead Poet Society. It's an older movie. Anybody ever seen that movie? And there's a scene in there where he has a book and a textbook and says, don't like that. He says, rip out the pages. Just rip them out. And the, the head person comes by and says, rip out the pages. It was really funny, but you can't do that with this. You can't rip out the pages you don't like and leave the rest that are, you're comfortable with. And that Christ continually calls us from that life. Let's go to Isaiah, prophet of the prophets, Isaiah 55. Fifty-five, starting in verse 1. Oh, and everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye and buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delighteth in its fatness. Incline your ear, come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Jump over to verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. The good thing is, is that his mercy is new every day. I think it's wonderful. I thought this the other morning. I woke up, been testing some little tents. And I was woke up in the tent, and, the, and I, I saw the beauty of the morning and how, how clean and fresh and pure every morning is to us. And it's a chance of a new day. And tomorrow is gone, folks. You can never revisit it, right? It's gone. And in the evening, we have these wonderful sunsets that bring peace and rest to contemplate on what we did that day. Was, was it appropriate? Was it what we should have done? And the peace to know that we could rest at tomorrow morning if I truly desire that freshness and that repentance can be new. My uh, father-in-law, Mel, always said there are only two questions you really have. When you go to bed, you ask, you, in the morning, you ask, Lord, help me do your will. And when you go to bed at night, you ask him, did I do it? Those really are the two big questions. A question came up in our adult class, a relevant question. We've had this series 
It was, uh, it was I think, uh, uh, it was a wonderful opportunity for the Spirit to move in us. There were people from other branches that came every night, and these two gentlemen came from the West Coast, and they, they, they bore testimony, and they spoke the Word, and they brought hope and enlightenment and lifted us. And uh, the question came up in class, what will we then do about that? And a question came back from Rich, who was leading the class, and that was a relevant question. But a relevant question came back from Rich, and his question was, what do we believe we should do? Because only what we believe we should and could do will we attempt. Not what someone else tells us to do. Not someone else has proposed for us to do. But there are some real and tangible things I think we can do and should do this day. I'm going to give you three, really shortly three. One, first, be honest in the light of the gospel message that you and I are sinners every day. That many things in our life are ungodly, that we have in this branch some personality traits that are ugly and unholy, and we deny the Lord access to those areas because we think we're privileged to do that, and so forgiveness is not possible in the middle of those areas in our secret sins because we won't confess them to him. And if you don't confess that he's Lord and he's Lord of your life, he can't forgive you of those. Let me give you a good example. There's a lot of sins. There's sins of neglect, sins of desire, sins of pride, sins of deception. Where is Megan at? Rhodes. Is she in here? I'm looking. Oh, there. Hi, Megan. I need to apologize to Megan. It came to my mind just yesterday. I bet a month, six weeks ago, Megan asked me to borrow something for a party, which I had. And I said, what I say, Megan? Sure, no problem, I'm coming into town. We're getting ready to go on vacation. I've traveled, I've been in almost like 13 national parks since March. I've been on the road a lot, photographing in other places, family vacations, and I forgot to do that. That's a sin of neglect. But I love Megan. And I love her husband and her children. Now, I know Megan well enough to know that this is probably, she said, Thomas isn't a big deal. I can see it in her face. But it's important that we acknowledge, because sometimes our sins of neglect are harmful and hurt people's feelings. And we just go on our way thinking, well, they should be big enough to deal with that, right? We should only go halfway to meet our brother. It would be a sad day if the Lord only went halfway to meet us. He said, I'll teach him the gospel I'll live a good life, but there's no way I'll go to Calvary for them. That's just a little too far for them. I'll wait for them to meet me halfway. Sins of desire, sins of pride, sins of deception. This and have a repentant heart is the beginning of our healing. Second, in the Doctrine and Covenants, God made it very clear we should be about good works. We should not have to always be told that something is good for us to do that. The example that Brian gave in his message was, if you saw an elderly lady walking across the street, and she's got some packages, and there's cars coming, and she can barely walk, does it, the Lord should not have to stand out and give you an angel message and say, Tom, you really ought to step down there and help her across. I should know, even without the testimony of Jesus, to do that, Right? And so there's some things we should be commanded in. And the Doctrine and Covenants says that he who has to be commanded in all things is a slothful servant. Doesn't sound like the person that's going to be the first person through the door into the kingdom. We know we should have purposeful prayer. We should feast upon the words of Christ. We should meet together often in this house of prayer. We are commanded and we know that we should keep the Lord's day Holy unto him, for it's his day. These are foundational to any discussion that we could have of the gospel of the kingdom. And finally, there are things that we can personally do based upon our gifts and talents. Let me give you two short examples. We had a wonderful series, and we talked a lot about um, the sacrifice, which it was, that Brian made and his cousin made and, and how we were blessed. I don't see him here today. But what you didn't see, maybe, I did, was the person that made that really possible. And there were several, but a member of our branch, Stu, on the Evangelism Commission, was the one that worked on that. 
and thought about it and asked people and worked with Brian, even when Brian said he couldn't come. And he was at the door every night to shake your hand. He was everywhere I was. He was announcing and promoting that series so it would be a success. No one told Stu to do that. Stu knew that that was his calling responsibility. And because of that, I believe, a lot of people attended. And because of that, they were blessed. Let me give you another short example. I saw it. Many of you have one of these. Okay, not a Book of Mormon, but one of these Book of Mormons. Anybody know where that really came from? There wasn't like some great, that I know of, maybe there was, revelation from God that came out and said, you know, we don't have a missionary copy of the Book of Mormon you can put in your pocket and carry. So three men in this branch of their own volition did some research, and because they're bright and they are talented in their skills, they gain copyright, they find a marvelous printer that could print copies they could give away and nice little leather-bound copies that you could keep and as a keepsake and put your name on and give it to your family members. And they acquired tons of proofreaders to proofread it. They made a wonderful index in the back, which is 10 times, 100 times what's in the 1908 version. They formed a company and made money to raise the initial funds for this, all because they had a desire to do something good for the Lord, according to the gifts and talents. The question is, saints, today, what gifts and talents do you have that you can step out to for the cause of the kingdom? May not be produce the Book of Mormon. May not be uh, set up or promote a series. But God has given to every man severally many gifts to use in his purpose. I ask Rachel to do a favor for me today. Ask her to play us a song. So she's going to get ready to do that right now. This, I was uh, with my family on a vacation. And uh, we were driving back. Uh, vacation very similar to the uh, Jason and Carmen took with their family. We were coming back, and I was in the middle of Wyoming, driving our little Civic in the middle of Wyoming. Wyoming is a beautiful state. Some places I think are a little more beautiful than others. Central Wyoming has its own beauty for a while. And we were in that part of Central Wyoming. We were driving, and I was worshiping. I was listening to some music on these little open-air headphones. Debbie was asleep in the car. Yes, you were. At first, you were asleep in the car. I was driving, and uh, she didn't remember this part because she was asleep, which she often does when I drive. James, of course, was in the back with... Well, he wasn't asleep like he is now, but headphones on, playing a video game. And I was in worship, and I was asking the Lord to forgive me my sins. I was, I was in, um, I had an unusual, for me, an unusual amount of the Spirit of God came into that car. And I was listening to some songs, and one of them, it may have been the last song, was this song. And uh, the Lord... Um, came into that car, and um, names began to um, come to my mind. And as I thought about them, the Lord, I believe, shared some things with me. When Debbie was driving, I, I grabbed the iPad and wrote down as much as I could, as quick as I could, because um, it's very lengthy, and I have a very short memory, as my friends will attest. Traveling across Colorado two days ago, I asked the Lord if that was just, um, that was just my good intentions. It was just because I like some of these people. Some of these people I, don't, I barely know. And the Lord confirmed uh, that it was not. And after returning and uh, asking some of the Melchizedek priesthood to read that, and then the pastorate, um, I believe I have sufficient witness to share it with you. I've asked Rachel that she'll play this song. So I'm, my prayer is that he will bring that same spirit that came to me into that car, into this sanctuary, and that I could share those things with you. I do not know why the Lord, um, among all the men that have discernment here, shared this with me. I do not know why the Lord chose to spoke to some and not to others. It is my prayer, though, that as... Um, we hear this together, we would rejoice in that he does speak in our day. 
and reveal himself unto the sons of men. Received July 15th, 2013. To his servant, Joseph Alanetz. It was not by chance that you were brought into association with your wife and her family in this body of saints. God has in many ways been well pleased with the earnestness of your response to the gospel and the humility you show in worship. Continue in faith to study diligently. Develop a lifestyle of purposeful prayer and spiritual discipline and be ready to accept service even when you feel ill-prepared and God will be with you. For Joseph, he has called you to the holy priesthood. Not only for these hours and for this office of ministry which you now hold, but for the days ahead which you are faithful, you will again feel his spirit move in you. In power, calling you to additional responsibility and service. Seek the counsel of those priesthood members close to you, and in particular, the mentorship of your brother in law, Danny Croson. For he has been ordained to a holy calling in the Melchizedek priesthood, and as he has at times sought God, and grown in spirit, so he has gained insight in faith and can assist you in the preparation for the ministry that lies ahead if you are faithful and humble, stripped of pride and self. God has entrusted to you and Andrea, children of the kingdom. Know that this great opportunity and responsibility should continue to be foremost in your thoughts and activities. Forsake the world, therefore, and cleave unto Jesus." I was not going to read the next section because this gentleman is not here. He now is attending the Oak Grove congregation. But the Spirit has moved upon me because his mother is here and his sister to read it for their hearing. To his servant, Jim Marsh. Be confident, Jim, that Jesus has not forgotten you. nor the calling entrusted to you to walk in his ways and serve among the people. He called you to this ministry in part because of the rich heritage you have in the gospel, which heritage seems to you to be spread far apart in the many factions and groups of his church in these last days. Be confident, Jim, that Jesus is in control of his church and that nothing will stand before his mighty hand when he recovers his sheep in due time. Be confident that God loves you deeply, that your call is indeed holy and true, and that the rich ministry that can come from the unity of your bright mind, your caring heart, and a dedicated service within the body of saints where you reside will do much good for the cause of Christ. God will not ask more of you than you are able to bear. Therefore, center your efforts and thoughts in those areas of your greatest talents, and confidence and service will open other opportunities in due time. Be sure and steadfast in these things. He will be with you until the end. To his young daughter, Emma Gilmore. Emma. Though you are young, know this day that God is aware of your faith in his son, Jesus. He speaks to you this day as he speaks to all of the young children in this branch who courageously and thoughtfully stand and pray among the saints, in part because of your firm mind and your simple willingness to love and follow him. As he loved and blessed the children in this branch in his earthly ministry, so now on this day he desires to impart a blessing to you and the children of this branch. He sees all things and knows that your heart is honest and your soul pure before him. Listen, Emma, to the teachings of your parents as they guide you in this life, for they were prepared for this task by the love and faith of their parents and adherence to the principles of the gospel. And let the blessings of your smile and the love in your heart. 
radiate to everyone you meet. To his servant, Mike Barrett, because of God's infinite wisdom and gracious mercy, he has brought you from the darkness of the valley of shadows and sorrow into the glorious light of day. He has heard your many prayers and supplications and has forgiven you your sins and been patient with your wanderings in days past because of his great and abiding love for you and the potential for good that resides within you. He sees your every need, your every concern, and has blessed you with the family you have longed for and prayerfully considered all the days of your life. Therefore, Mike, have faith in Christ. Be patient and long-suffering unto those you are called to serve, as he has been so patient and forgiving toward you. And you will more fully discover the exceeding great joy that comes in a full and rich ministry for Jesus Christ. Multiply your many gifts, especially those of preaching and home ministry, in preparation for the work that yet lies ahead in your life if you are faithful. And so he calls you this day, Michael, to be courageous. Never succumb to the fears of this life, for the perfect love of Christ casts out all fears. And lo, he is with you always. To the family of Mike and Linda Friend, our Heavenly Father is well pleased with the character and demeanor by which you have raised your children, and in particular, to your desires and discipline in personal worship, and that spirit you bring to this house of worship. Continue to pray for the saints. Be assured your dedication and struggles have not gone unnoticed, and that in the life to come, the faithful and those that have kept hope in Christ and those that love without measure will set down in the kingdom of God. To Kara Andrew. Do not be surprised that God who continually reveals himself each day in the movements of the sun and the moon and the stars would condescend to speak to you his creation as he has spoken to others in days past which are recorded in his holy word. Know that he is aware of the thoughts and questions in your mind and your heart. If this church, or any particular church, is a true representation of the gospel of his Son, and if that concept matters in this life, he has seen your willingness to give service to those around you and a growing willingness to explore more of this faith. Kara, know that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him in faith and in prayer. To Jordan Brennan, God has heard your prayers and seen the sincerity of your heart as you have earnestly sought him. As you at times have been aware, he has brought to your mind those insights which have led to the future yet before you. He has already begun in you the preparation for ministry. If you continue to be faithful and steadfast, you will hear your name called to stand in service next to your father. Be humble and diligent, doubting nothing. To Philip Mitchell, God is pleased with your efforts this day and the decisions you have made to more fully return to service to the saints according to your office and calling. He is aware, Philip, of the many burdens you have borne, burdens of health, burdens of occupation, burdens of family, and burdens of loneliness. But rest assured that in all these trials, he has been your unseen companion, watching and protecting you because of his great love and compassion. And as you more fully respond to that guiding spirit within you, making at times difficult and challenging decisions, he will continue to open those doors and provide opportunities for needed changes and for additional service. You are counseled to be patient. Do not run faster than it is expedient, and he will be your continued guide. To Glenn Friend, 
Long and cared has been your service to your family, and especially your wife, June. Years of me have tempered to a leader with particular knowledge and gifts of memory. And now a freedom to use those gifts, lies of saints, and measure is given. As you are keen aware, God loves all your children and sees their struggles, their trials, their hearts, and themes. Continue to counsel them in a prayer they may remain faithful and find joy and peace desire. To you and to Delhen, to Mark Wynn and Vernon Darling. His high priest out the order of the Son of God, spiritual leader and spirituals of all God's sons and daughters, you more than any other have seen and heard and for cries of his people to be free from the burdened sins of this life. Many years of service, care, compassion, guidance have offered many in their walk to follow Jesus. Never before ministered spiritual leader of more value, be greater of the saints than in these dark times of confusion. Be assured the Father is aware that your bodies, your minds, your souls are many times weary. You have often discouraged as others, many times to you, has risen and fallen in pride and self-centeredness, causing division and strife. And in these days of sifting, you wait for peace. Endure a little longer. Continue to stretch forth your hearts and hands in earnest for the souls of his sons and daughters. And as in times past, the power, the discernment, and the love of Jesus Christ will flood over you and out to the dry and places where the saints thirst for truth and direction. For in these days of darkness, the saints hunger not for bread, but hunger and are thirsting to hear the word of God. Even so, amen.